There's an old saying about the sky is the limit. In reality, the sky is not the limit. The limit is wherever we set our hearts, wherever we set our minds, and wherever we set our desires. The only limits we have are those of our own courage and imagination. generation of young Americans looks to the moon, Mars, and beyond with optimism, energy, and wonder. Exploration is part of human destiny. It's important to explore the unknown, and from that, bring back knowledge that will further how we think about the Earth, the solar system, and the universe. We've looked in the oceans, we've looked in our atmosphere, and we want to get out beyond it. And SLS is a key piece to, to helping us to live our nature of exploration. Without our suppliers and vendors, this mission, deep space exploration, would not be possible. I appreciate that passion that I see in the workforce, and I appreciate the passion that I see as I meet people, you know, shake people's hands, and the guys that are up there doing welding, uh, these various you know, components, and the attention to detail and the tolerances that they are working towards. It's just, it's mind boggling. We will return American astronauts to the moon. Not only to leave behind footprints and flags, but to build the foundation we need to send Americans to Mars and beyond. Space is limitless. We should be limitless as humans trying to get out into space. This is an amazing vehicle and state-of-the-art ground systems. You're a part of the team that is bringing all of that together. We're gonna go out and do what to a lot of people still today sounds like magic. Well, as uh, one of my uh, pastors used to say, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. <laughs> so let me introduce our moderator for this panel, Bill Hill. He, Bill is NASA's Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development at NASA Headquarters. In this role, he is and provides executive leadership and program management for SLS, the Orion Crew Vehicle, and Exploration Ground Systems and Overall Systems Integration. Bill, I'm gonna let you introduce your panel. Uh, panel, if anybody has charts, Bill has the clicker and he can pass that along. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Welcome to our panel session this morning. Uh, we have, I have with me the, our panel of uh, our prime contractors under the Exploration Systems Development uh, portfolio. And what I'll do is kind of give you an overview of the, uh, of what we're doing. And then let's see if we'll go, it's gonna go through everybody. My charts aren't up there. Anyway, uh, I'll just, since my charts don't seem like they're up there, I'll just go ahead and just talk through it real quick. Um, we were fortunate in, uh, in this administration to get a, uh, a space policy directive that kind of kept us on the same course but made it a slight alteration. 
Um, we were asked to uh, lead an innovative and sustainable program of exploration with commercial and international partners uh, to enable human, expert, human expansion across the solar system and bring back to Earth new knowledge and opportunities. Um, the, the good news here is uh, it, it talks about beginning with missions uh, beyond low Earth orbit. Um, the United States will lead the return of humans to the moon for long-term exploration and utilization, followed by the human, followed by human missions to Mars and other destinations. And, and that's the kind of course we were on, and, and so we're kind of staying on that course. Um, oh, there they are. We're expanding in our human presence in a partnership with, uh, with industry and, uh, and international partners. It's a five-phased approach beginning in, Le in low Earth orbit. We've been there for uh, sustained for over 18 years. Moving out in the early 20s with Orion and SLS and, and the ground systems that support it. Bringing on uh, commercial launch payload services to the surface. Uh, small landers at first and then uh, moving into the mid to late uh, 20s with the, the gateway uh, that we're talking about for cislunar orbit in the uh, uh, near retrograde uh, heli um, orbit that uh, goes around the moon. It, there's two basic uh, orbits. Uh, one gets close to either pole. We can move it. Uh, to either the North Pole or the South Pole, and then goes out about 70,000 kilometers. In the early 20s, um, we look to do, early to mid-20s, we look to do more mid-range uh, mid landers, and then uh, eventually toward the uh, middle to end of uh, the 20s, uh, human-rated landers uh, to go to the surface of the moon. Um, and then further down, uh, venturing out into the... Uh, into the solar system, to Mars. Orion and, and the Orion spacecraft and SLS rocket uh, launching from a modernized Kennedy Space Center will be the foundational portions of our exploration program and, and getting humans into deeper space. Our first mission is uh, Exploration Mission 1, which we're looking at in, in 2020. It's an uncrewed mission that we're going to go out and, uh, and go into a distant retrograde orbit around the moon. We chose that because that's where we were originally uh, planning to go, and as we refined our analysis, uh, we moved more to the near retro, uh, rectilinear orbit. Um, so that's uh, Exploration Mission 1, about a 20 to 24 day mission, um, again uncrewed. We're going to uh, deploy 13 CubeSats. This is a unique opportunity that will... Uh, enable us to deploy CubeSats outside low Earth, the low Earth orbit. Exploration Mission 2 is our first crewed test flight. Um, we're going to go out and do a highly elliptical orbit around Earth, check out our uh, uh, life support systems, environmental control systems, because we'll be using those for the first time, and then uh, do a translunar injection burn and go to a free uh, return trajectory around the moon and back. Uh, path to the lunar surface, uh, basically lay, laid out for the next uh, next 10 years. Um, you'll hear a lot about this in the Gateway Next Steps tomorrow at the 11.15 panel, so I'm not going to really go into too much on that. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll start by introducing our panels. I'll ask you all to uh, try to maintain five, five minutes so we can leave some time for uh, audience questions. Our first panelist is Andy Allen. Andy is the Vice President and General Manager for Jacob Space Operations Group at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Jacob Space Operations Group provides overall management and implementation of ground systems capabilities, flight hardware processing, and launch operations at KSC as a part of the test and operations support contract. Before joining Jacobs, Andy served in a variety of uh, space industry leadership positions and, uh, and before that as an a NASA astronaut. Uh, Andy became an astronaut in uh, 1988 and is a veteran of uh, three uh, shuttle flights, serving as a pilot on two missions, STS-46 and 62, and then as commander on STS-75. Please welcome Andy Allen. All right. 
Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, weather up here is absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> um, I'd like to stick around a little while longer because it's still in the 80s down there in Florida, uh, but we'll get there one of these days. Um, so I wanted to show the first, what I call concept of operations. So what we do here at the Kennedy Space Center, Kennedy Space Center is basically the, the last event, the last link in the chain before we can get off the pad and get our, get our great, fantastic, wonderful rocket off that pad and, and get our hardware into orbit. So as the components come to the Kennedy Space Center, and, and some of which are already being worked on down at the Kennedy Space Center, they'll at some point transition over to the test and operations support contract, that's us. It comes with, a, with some assembly required. And then we'll go through our processes that we have down there at the Kennedy Space Center, and we'll go ahead and uh, do the integration test checkout, get it out to the pad, and then we'll go ahead and get it off the pad, and at the end we'll do some of the landing and recovery on the other side. Uh, so we're a critical piece, and, and for the last few years, while the other programs have been really building their hardware, that's going to be the greatest event that that I think we've ever seen when we see that when we see the first launch come up here pretty soon. Um, we've we've been pretty busy at Kennedy Space Center getting a lot of things ready to go and a lot of things ready to work. We have a multi-payload processing facility, which is going to payload the service module and the control module. I'm going to go through these pretty quick. Uh, we had to do a lot of testing of all the umbilicals that we have to be using that are going to take us from the ground hardware into the flight hardware and make sure we can load up all the propellants, cryogenics, and anything else, all the hypergolics, all the things that we've got to be able to load and make work and be able to pass on the data telemetry and, and do our test and check out and get it ready to go and get it off the pad. Uh, a lot of work was done at the launch equipment test facility, the LETF. Uh, but we pretty much have the umbilicals done, we're ready to go, and they're on, on the mobile launcher at this time. The crawler transporter, 1950s vintage kind of a thing, it was here for the Apollo program. <clears throat> a lot of modification that we had to perform on this vehicle. A lot of the vehicle hadn't been opened up in, in 50 years, so we had to go in, change out gears, gearboxes, uh, a lot of components in the vehicles had to be upgraded to be able to take the heavy load out to the pad on that crawler way. So the, the load that it takes is gonna, could potentially be up to 18 million pounds. Uh, this is when we were taking the mobile launcher out to the pad. So we took the mobile launcher out to the launch pad here recently and we went ahead and then set it down at the pad and then we brought it back in the pad. This is a quick little animation, only lasts for about 30 or 40 seconds of the mobile launcher going out to the pad. So we're back in the VAB now. We took it out to the pad, we took, back it, we took it back into the VAB and in the VAB we're gonna go through about 10, 12 months worth of multi-element verification and validation that we'll do on all the components of the mobile launcher that have been built. This mobile launcher started out to support the ARIES program. And we've modified it pretty tremendously to make sure it happens. As we took it out to the pad, it had a top speed of about 0.9 miles an hour. This is the hairpin curve that it's got to go through <laughs> as it goes out to the pad. We had to slow down to about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 miles an hour for this. Vertical assembly building had a lot of uh, renovations that had to take place and we had to put in the platforms that are going to be able to give us access to all the components that we need to do when we start the stacking operation. Launchpad had a tremendous amount of uh, modifications as well. Launchpad is pretty much ready to go. Launch control center, brand new launch control centers, modified launch control centers. We are also doing the application software and the operating system software that has to support the launch control center. So we are significant cahoots with the, with the other programs on making sure we get the software right. And the, and the last thing I show, just as, just as we get the boosters, which are gonna come to us, uh, and these components, we bring them in, we rotate them, we, well, we inspect them, we rotate them, and then we'll do some stacking of the boosters. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, next on our panel, we have Mike Hawes. Mike is the Vice President and Orion Program Manager for Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company. Mike joined Lockheed Martin in July of 2011 after 
including a distinguished 33-year career at NASA that included uh, uh, a, a stint as the uh, International Space Station Director at NASA headquarters. Uh, he was selected uh, to head up the uh, Lockheed Martin's Orion program in, in uh, 2014. Prior to joining the Orion program, Mike served as Director of Human Space Flight Programs with Lockheed Martin's Washington Operations Organization. Please welcome Mike Hawes. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to take uh, a little bit of time just to give you a sense of where Orion is. And when we talk about the Orion program today, we talk about it operating concurrently in multiple swim lanes. Uh, we have the, the EM-1 swim lane, which the, the crew module itself is nearly complete. Uh, down in Florida, we use the, the uh, Neil Armstrong ONC building as our factory, in fact. Uh, the pressure vessel is built over and machined, but then everything else is actually added on in the ONC building. Uh, we are probably within a couple weeks of getting an ESA service module. In fact, the team is over in Bremen as we speak, uh, kicking off the precursor team reviews before Mark and I head over to the pre-ship review uh, next week. We'll be headed out this weekend for pre-ship review next week, and then we anticipate that uh, Airbus will ship on November 4th and arrive November 6th at the Kennedy Space Center. That kicks off then a really high intensity uh, integration and test phase that uh, right now lasts about 13, a little over 13 months. We'll probably see a little bit of push on that as some traveled work moves once we get through our pre-ship review and know the details of, of all that. And that includes uh, that entire stack going on the guppy up to uh, Mansfield, Ohio to be trucked up to Plumbrook uh, in Sandusky, Ohio for uh, environmental testing. We also have uh, a structural test article, basically a twin of the EM-1 spacecraft that has been undergoing testing for the last year in uh, mostly in Denver, in our Waterton uh, facility there in Denver. Uh, we also have uh, AA-2, and so the ascent abort test is actually coming up very soon. It's coming up next April. And so uh, we're providing the launch abort system for that. Uh, NASA has built the actual test capsule, and uh, Northrop Grumman is providing the test booster. And so we have uh, activity actually across uh, our team for that, and that'll be a critical test, basically doing the, uh, the full abort sequence at max Q um, after launch. And then we're already uh, doing significant work on EM-2. The pressure vessel has been delivered to Florida for EM-2. So all of the additional pieces of primary structure are being added to the, the pressure vessel as we speak. We have component parts being built all around the country. Uh, the ESA service module to its structure is delivered and they are also continuing on their outfitting. And then we're starting down the path of, of buying long lead parts for the EM-3. Uh, mission as well, and uh, in the process of working the, the contract for EM3 and beyond, but we do have authority to start into long lead parts. So those are all of the things that are going on concurrently on Orion today. Uh, this shows you some of the components of the uh, AA2 test, the, uh, some of the uh, motors of the launch abort system that we're providing with uh, Northrop Grumman and Aerojet Rocketdyne as our primary teammates there. And that shows the test capsule that um, the NASA folks uh, have built. And I believe, Bill, that's predominantly a uh, coordination between JSC and Langley as the test vehicle. And if this works, this was just a little clip movie, but it didn't work. So here's where EM-1 is today in the ONC building. Uh, uh, we haven't put the back shell panels with the tiles on it yet just to leave access for all the final integration, but um, essentially the spacecraft is, is complete. We're swapping out some avionics units as we have had to change some parts through test, uh, and then as soon as ESA shows up in a couple weeks, we'll start into integration. If you remember the, the picture of the configuration, there's a large ring that we call the crew module adapter. We build that, that's just off to the side here in the ONC, and then the, uh, uh, that 
is the first piece that mates to the European surface module. So that will happen pretty quickly once the ESM arrives and goes through its initial uh, test to make sure that we haven't done anything in transport. Uh, and then a couple months later, we'll actually dock the crew module to that stack, and that's when it's ready to get shipped out to, to Plum Brook. So next spring, uh, we'll start to see the activity geared towards the, the Plum Brook testing. Uh, this is the European service module, uh, a couple of views of uh, that. This is the uh, aft end with the propulsion system. Here's with the, the Ohms engine. Remember the, the ESM, NASA is actually contributing uh, leftover Ohms engines to uh, the ESM as their primary propulsion system, uh, which uh, Andy talked a little bit about the challenge of open up parts of crawler transporters that hadn't been opened for decades. Uh, we found a bit of the same with Ohm's engines that hadn't really been torn apart and redone for years. So there has certainly been some challenges in, in using that equipment. Uh, this is the structural test article out in, in Denver. So we have tested all up through the, the launch abort uh, stack. We've tested a number of different configurations, both structural loading, acoustic, pyroshock. Um, that testing is all going well in a variety of different configurations. This is full up with the outer uh, jettisonable panels uh, surrounding the service module. And then this is the EM2 crew module structure that's been delivered to, to Florida. And then this is the ESM2 primary structure that is in the assembly hall in Bremen. Uh, one of the points that I wanted to make, uh, particularly uh, from a Lockheed standpoint on the, on the EM2, Hey, it works. I can actually go backwards. The uh, this is actually the fifth flight type crew module that we've built. The first was what we called our ground test article, which was an early structural and acoustic test vehicle. And if you remember back then, that pressure vessel was made of 33 parts with 33 welds. EFT one was constructed with 18 major parts and 18 welds where now both EM1 and EM2 are seven parts with just seven welds. Through the course of that time, we've pulled uh, over 4,000 pounds out of the vehicle. Uh, and because we're also able now to stabilize engineering, one of the themes that I wanted to, to hit on, I think we all have a sense of, is affordability driving into the future. Uh, because we were able to keep the engineering fundamentally the same, for EM2, just the price of all of those pressure vessel parts is about 50% of what it was for EM1. And we continue to drive across the, the system to look for efficiencies, but it really comes to that point of being able to hold a stable design and uh, maintain stability across the supply chain that you know many of the folks here are all part of that challenge with us. Uh, and so we continue to drive that day in and, and day out. And so uh, looking forward to the EM-1 flight and to the future flights and, and looking forward to building even more of these spacecraft in the ONC. And that's done for me. Okay, thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Next. <clears throat> Next we have Charlie Precourt. Charlie is the uh, Vice President and General Manager for Pul Propulsion Systems for Northrop Grumman. He is responsible for key programs, including the solid rocket booster uh, for NASA's Space Launch System, uh, Trident 2 D5 and Minuteman 3 strategic missile production lines, the ground-based mid-course defense program, and commercial rockets and products. Uh, before coming to orbital ATK, uh, which now is uh, North Grumman, Charlie had a distinguished 15-year career with NASA, serving as in technical positions and as a uh, space shuttle astronaut. Charlie served as a um, mission specialist on STS-55, a uh, pilot on STS-71, which was the first shuttle docking with, uh, with Mir, and then as commander for STS-84 and 91. Please welcome Charlie Precourt. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I can fly a space shuttle, but I'm not sure I can fly these things, so we'll have to see how this goes. Good morning, everybody. Um, 
delight to be here, and I think we're in the middle of a transition now to the vehicle side of the conversation yeah. with uh, John and Julie and I to, to give you an update on how the SLS is, is going. But before I get into that, I'd like to piggyback a little bit on what Mike said about uh, the launch abort system, since uh, I'm going to focus on the booster, but we do provide the, the, uh, the booster for the abort system as well, and that's a system that's near and dear to my heart as a, uh, a former astronaut. Um, you know, we didn't have that on the space shuttle. We had parachutes and a pole that stuck out the side of the hatch, um, and it was a miracle if we were ever going to get to that point in a flight trajectory, we could actually use that. Uh, but this system that we're developing uh, with, uh, with Mike at the lead here with Lockheed and uh, NASA Johnson uh, is really a huge step forward for crew safety and survivability. Uh, you have to think about it not just as a booster that throws the capsule off the front end like a, a, a dumb ejection seat in a, in a uh, fighter jet. It is actually a very sophisticated launch vehicle in its own right launching. Think about it, launching a launch vehicle off of a flying launch vehicle itself um, that is out of control and moving in directions that aren't predictable. It's really a phenomenal system that is going to be a huge enhancement for the survivability of crew going forward. Um, I'll also tell you that I feel like um, I was when I was on the launch pad for my four flights, and I see Wayne over here, he was my launch director for most of those. I think all four of them actually. Um, T minus 31 seconds, it's when it got real and we handed off control to the internal computers of the shuttle. I'm feeling like that right now because we're in the final throes of delivering hardware. So we're at T minus 31, we really got to deliver and we got to get this thing to go. Um, and that means a lot of things have to happen. Um, Andy talked to you about what comes together at the Cape, what the four of us have to do to deliver that stuff for him to th at the Cape and to keep this thing going so we can get it off uh, here in another 18 to 20 months or so. Um, a lot of good things have to happen, just like a lot of good things have to happen inside of 31 seconds when we lift it off. And so I will tell you um, that uh, we have to execute, but we also have to be planning for the future uh, in terms of survivability, sustainability, and affordability. And I used all those three words intentionally about this program. We here in this inside the program tend to not think about the need to advocate. There are a lot of people who have other ideas on how we should do this mission. And so I think it's incumbent on us it's not too early to be thinking about the transition from development to production, and that means a totally different management uh, philosophy uh, and, and cost structure for all of us. And Mike hit on it, he used the number 50%, and I think all of us need to be thinking about our annual budget for this is not what it is in development. And it's a very serious problem that we have to look forward to and try to rectify so that we are survival sustainable and affordable. So um, with that, let me give you an update on how we're doing on, on the, uh, the booster itself. Um, we're uh, focused on hardware <coughs> delivery to the ground systems element. All of our EM1 booster segments have been cast. Uh, Ten of them uh, will be through final assembly before Thanksgiving. So we're in really good shape for EM1. Uh, we did have challenges with the design of what we call the propellant liner insulator interface. Um, that was probably the biggest challenge that we went through in, in tra transitioning from shuttle uh, to um, the SLS. Uh, and what that is, is uh, think of it like the layers of, a, as you look at the cross section of a piece of plywood, you have the propellant on the inside of the booster, then you have a liner, then you have an insulator, and then you have the outer case. All those layers have to be um, very solidly linked together in a composite sandwich structure that is structurally sound. And uh, when we came out of shuttle, the insulator is a, in there is designed to protect the, the walls of the case uh, from the 5,000 degrees that are burning on the inside of the booster. And that insulator used to have asbestos in it back in the shuttle days, and we had to get rid of that. And in the process of finding a different material, uh, we had issues with off-gassing in the rubber that was creating problems for us in the bond line that has to be there. Uh, for that composite material. We've worked through that now and we're in a very solid place. Uh, and so we're in the process of, of building out the EM2 boosters. Um, and uh, we have uh, seven of those uh, motors have been cast and uh, look into the full completion of the booster element, which has the thrust vector control on the back end and avionics in the front end. We've got the left hand and right hand aft skirts through final integration. Uh, and the left-hand assembly checkout is next month. That involves a lot of um, hot firing and so forth of the TVC system. And the forward assembly buildups have been started and are, are underway. So good progress 
on the booster, and we're really looking forward to handing that stuff off to Andy. So, um, as we we transition uh, into the future, we are really focused on uh, efficiency improvements. Uh, I put a picture of the Omega vehicle uh, in the lower right-hand corner for a reason. You might say, what does that got to do with SLS? And I'll tell you, it has everything to do with SLS. Omega was designed with SLS in mind. Uh, if you look at the core of that, you have two small strap-ons, uh, but down at the core, that is essentially the same size booster as the two segments of a five-segment SLS booster. Um, and that was done intentionally because we were able to take and uh, synergize the efforts in the plant with respect to tooling, design, sustainment, uh, supply chain, and so forth. And effectively, if you think about it, as Omega flies, it increases the flight rate of the boosters for SLS, and that is an affordability feature. On top of that, as we design uh, for the future, what we know is NASA has us on what we call a booster obsolescence and life extension uh, program. Uh, which is taking the current booster with the steel case that we used in shuttle, which we know will run out, uh, and plan for that obsolescence into the future with a design that is sustainable and more affordable going forward. And so we intentionally designed the Omega Core with the idea that it would be transferable directly to the booster for SLS in the long run as an in-state configuration. Because what we want to do is stop spending on the booster and its development and on the SLS vehicle writ large and its development and spend on the real mission that goes on in space. And to do so, we have to lock down and fully implement our design. Uh, we've got to keep refining our production flow. We've got to implement material cost reduction initiatives, get that production cadence going, and make sure we get these synergies between these two programs to really deliver. Um, there's no reason that we can't be delivering very, very uh, cost-effective boosters uh, for the future based on this kind of philosophy. But it, it will require a totally different mindset as we move, as I said at the beginning here, we move from development to production. We have to change our thought about what the annual budget means. Um, we're being funded at a very s a significant amount for development to get through this, but we have to be lean uh, going forward. So uh, when it comes to this particular uh, new design that's going into Omega. We've invested already in the um, uh, tooling to do composite case winding, uh, the design of that booster. So a lot of that investment uh, was in concert with the Air Force and will be directly applicable and not need to be respent again as we go forward on the future uh, booster enhancements. So uh, lots of work to do. We've got to focus on execution and then make sure we get our, our mindset on affordability. And I don't think it's too early for all of us at on this panel as well as our counterparts at NASA start thinking about what are the new models with contracting rules, uh, acquisition, block buys, all kinds of things, synergy with other programs that will make us more affordable. So thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. See, next we have John Shannon. John serves as the Space Launch System Vice President and Program Manager leading the Boeing team in designing, developing, producing, and testing the core stage in avionics uh, for NASA's new heavy lift rocket. Uh, prior to joining Boeing, uh, John served in, in many different areas within NASA. Um, lastly, as the Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration Planning in our Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. Prior to that, he was the uh, uh, I guess he wasn't exactly the last uh, program manager because I think Dorothy claims that, but uh, <laughs> he was a program manager that, for a space shuttle that flew out uh, the space shuttle program from 2008 till 2011. Please welcome John Shannon. <laughs> thanks, Bill. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot, and uh, it's great to, to be here and to welcome all of you to, uh, to Huntsville. Um, Boeing does two things in the, uh, in the development of the Space Launch System. We developed the largest cryogenic stage uh, ever built, and that was designed here in Huntsville. So the town ought to be extremely proud of that. And the uh, upper stage, which uh, right now is the, uh, the ICPS, the uh, Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, which is built just down the road in the uh, ULA facility in uh, Decatur, so a lot of uh, a lot of Huntsville has uh, has gone into this rocket. Let me uh, let me go to the first chart. Um, so Boeing is building uh, the core stage, which is the uh, the primary um, first stage for the uh, for the SLS. Of course, we have the boosters on the side, 
It's made of uh, five different pieces. Uh, numbered there, number one is the engine section. Of course, that's the very bottom of the rocket where, uh, where Julie's uh, outstanding engines go. Uh, number two is a 130-foot liquid hydrogen tank, and uh, we have built our third one of those. So let me tell you, they are immense. If you haven't, uh, haven't seen the tank up close, you will be amazed that we can even produce enough uh, liquid hydrogen to, to fill that one up. Uh, number three is the, uh, what's called the intertank. It has a lot of the avionics for the core stage. The core stage flies itself. Uh, it also has a, a large I-beam through the middle of it, which is the structural backbone for the entire SLS, and it attaches to the for two forward attach points for, uh, for Charlie's team's boosters. Above that is the liquid oxygen tank, and on top of that is the uh, forward skirt, which also has a number of avionics and is the uh, connection point to the adapter for the, uh, for the upper stage uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the rocket. Now, we have, uh, uh, we have transitioned down at uh, the Mashoud facility. Uh, we had focused uh, previously on just the uh, finishing of each of those five different pieces, and you can see them at the bottom there. Uh, by and large, the, uh, the work for each of the individual elements uh, is complete, except for the engine section, which is about 80% complete with a good target towards finishing it uh, at the end of this year on, uh, on December 21st. So now we're into a new phase of the, uh, of the production program down at, uh, at Michoud, and that's our, uh, our integration and joining of those five pieces together and doing all the testing on it. And it's kind of a, kind of a great spot to be in in the program right now. If you look at the, um, at the four of six stages flight elements complete piece, the upper stage has, uh, has been uh, completed, tested, delivered down to Kennedy Space Center. It's sitting inside the old uh, space station processing facility area. The uh, forward skirt has been completed, checked out, and uh, is ready to go. The uh, liquid oxygen tank is having its final sensor mast installed inside of it. That just tells you how much propellant you have in it. Uh, and the inner tank, which is a, a fairly complex uh, piece of uh, hardware, has been completed. Uh, we went through a very vigorous testing, not just of the avionics, but all of the development flight instrumentation to give us the information we need on the first flight. Uh, and it has now been loaded in the stacking cell. Um, so what happens over the next, uh, next month is we will bring the LOX tank over and uh, stack it on top of the inner tank. Then we'll bring the forward skirt over and uh, stack it on top of that. And that will be our forward joint piece. And that will be completed uh, within two months. The, uh, the interesting part of that is if, if you've been to the Michoud uh, High Bay area, it's, it's a very, very tall building, but it's not near tall enough to handle the, the first core stage of the SLS. So we have to build it in two pieces. After that forward joint is done, it'll be laid down on its side and taken to final assembly. Uh, and then we, uh, once we complete the engine section at the end of this year, it will be mated with the, uh, with the liquid hydrogen tank. Uh, that'll be laid over, taken over to final assembly, and then uh, early next year we'll get into the overall integration of the entire uh, first stage. Now, we're not just building the, the first uh, rocket for flight. We're also building all the structural coal uh, articles. The uh, ICPS was delivered and, and tested at Marshall, and uh, it passed its tests with flying colors. The engine section as well was, uh, was brought over from Michoud, put into its test stand, uh, it went through a, a series of tests where we put up to 2 million pounds of force on that engine section where the, uh, where the engine connections are, and uh, it did extremely well also. The uh, inner tank was delivered, and it is in its test stand. It went through its initial influence test where you just make sure that the, the calibration <laughs> of the loads is correct and uh, passed that well. The hydrogen tank will be here at the end of the year, and that will be an amazing kind of thing. If you've, if you've gone on site at Marshall, there's a a very large uh, test stand uh, that will be able to accept that entire hydrogen tank. It's going to be put through its paces and actually it will be taken to failure um, because we want to be able to evolve this rocket uh, to carry more and more payloads, larger upper stages, uh, components of the gateway. Uh, you want to really know what kind of structural capability you have in, uh, in the largest part of your, uh, of your tank, so it will be taken to failure after all the other testing is done. And the, uh, the same with the liquid oxygen tank, which will be, uh, be tested in the spring. So the, uh, the flight article itself is going through its, uh, its integration, and the structural coil articles are all being delivered and tested, and so far everything looks really good. 
Um, the way uh, our sequence works is uh, much like the other guys here have uh, talked about uh, while we're doing our final assembly in our joins down in uh, at uh, Kennedy at uh, Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans, uh, the uh, SLS structural testing will be going on here at Marshall. So we have a really big six-month period in front of us for both of those activities. Once the uh, flight vehicle is completed, it will be put on the uh, the modified barge that used to bring the uh, external tanks to Kennedy Space Center. Uh, it's been modified to be able to ha handle the, the much longer length of the core stage, and it will be taken out of Michoud, driven up the, uh, the Pearl River to Stennis Space Center. Uh, the B-2 test stand has been modified by NASA uh, to, uh, to take that core stage. We just installed the uh, hold downs because we do not want Stennis to become a launch facility. We'd like it to stay a test facility. So there are these giant hold downs that we, uh, we put under these... Um, uh, big proof tests to make sure they were uh, they were good to go. That all testing went went really well. We will mount the uh, the core stage up on B2. Uh, we'll do all of our checks, hydraulics, avionics, um, and then we'll get into what's called a wet dress rehearsal, where we fill up the vehicle with cryogens for the first time, uh, make sure that everything behaves as appropriate. We'll drain it, do engineering reviews, then we'll load it up again, and we'll do our hot fire. And it's going to be an eight minute firing of all four. RS-25 engines. I almost called them SSME engines. And uh, that's going to be an amazing thing. I have never experienced anything like that. Um, I've seen many uh, single-engine SSME tests, and they are awe-inspiring and incredible. And the fact that we're going to fire off four of them for eight minutes, I, it will al alternately be exhilarating and also terrifying. terrifying. So <laughs> it's, uh, I can't wait to go do that. And uh, once we get that done, we will uh, deintegrate the core stage from the uh, from the test stand, put it back in the barge, bring it around to Kennedy Space Center, where Andy is uh, is going to pick it up, and we should have some boosters sitting on a mobile launch platform at that point, and uh, we'll lift that uh, that core stage right over the uh, the VAB wall like we did with the external tanks and orbiters, and join it together, and then we'll get into the testing program at uh, Kennedy Space Center. So uh, it's going to be an amazing year uh, for the entire team. Uh, we talk about uh, the optimization, you know, it, this is our first vehicle. Uh, it's the first of this uh, uh, development cycle. I'm, I'm a little jealous of, of Mike and the fact that he's on his fifth uh, capsule. That's when you've really learned how to do it, how to build it. We're still in that learning cycle. Um, we, we end up doing a lot of things for the first time. The, the very comforting thing for me is um, we started to track how long does it take to build a tank? And the first time you do it, it may take eight months. The second time you do it, it takes us about five months. And then the third time you do it, it takes about three months. And, and we see that across the entire factory. Uh, we're able to get a lot faster, uh, a lot more uh, accurate uh, in our predictions of how long it takes to do certain things. And uh, we think that as we get into the flow for the second and third and fourth uh, SLS core stages, that uh, the process will, uh, will be well understood and we'll be able to make really good predictions on when things are ready. Um, we have already started the core stage two build. Uh, while I was at Michoud last uh, Friday, we had lifted the forward skirt into our big welding tool and we're welding the, um, the flange ring onto it. Uh, as well, we were populating the inner tank uh, panels. So core stage two, 98% of the parts are at Michoud and, um, and uh, now we're starting the, uh, the assembly, the early structural assembly for the core stage two pieces uh, while we finish up the uh, integration of core stage one. Um, for exploration upper stage, uh, because the, uh, the second mobile launcher was being built and we've added a couple of additional uh, ICPS missions, we've slowed down the uh, production of the exploration upper stage. We've talked about that some. Um, and NASA has asked us to go off and look at ways to optimize it for the TLI mass so that we can get more mass uh, through TLI to the uh, to the lunar orbit area, and we are uh, actively working on uh, on all of the engineering trade-offs to make uh, EUS an even better uh, even better upper stage to eventually uh, augment what we do with the uh, ICPS upper stage. And that's what I have. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, next, we have Julie Van Cleek. Uh, Julie is the Vice President of Advanced Space and Launch Propuls Propulsion and Power Business Sector for uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. Her organization is designing, developing, and building the next generation of propulsion and power 
for civil, military, and commercial applications. Julie has held a, a variety of technical and managerial positions over the last three decades at Aerojet Rocketdyne, and she, uh, she has a mechanical and aeronautical engineering degree from the University of California. Please welcome Julie Van Cleef. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, thanks, Bill, for the intro, and thanks to AAS for inviting us here. Um, I've been on this panel. Um, we've had a similar panel the last few years here, and um, it's just amazing to see the progress that's been made. I mean, it started a few years ago with more just PowerPoint slides of pictures of CAD models, and now what we're seeing is hardware everywhere, and that's the state we're in. Um, I think we're all looking very, very much forward to EM1, but, you know, the one thing we got to remember is this is not a point point design. This is not a mission. This is, we're building the infrastructure for space for our country for the next few decades. And that's what, as you look at the different, um, you know, presentations and you see the parallel paths of EM1, EM2, producing this, producing that, what we're really looking at is producing that infrastructure so that space becomes a more regular thing for us, something that we do. And it's not just, you know, humans, it's deep space exploration also. So I think the, the term sustainability, you know, is a real key one. We talk affordability, of course, to be sustainable, you've got to be affordable. But I'm really looking at the sustainability side of this, and, and, I'm, and I'm hopeful we're building the infrastructure for not just this generation, but the next generation. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, our status on EM1, what we're doing beyond that. But I thought I'd start with this uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne picture of a you know potential architecture, and it's really to emphasize the um, sustainability aspect and the infrastructure aspect of what we're doing. Along the bottom is notional timing, and along the um, side are some of the various systems, and then you see the Moon and Mars, of course, not to scale. I mean, I. It just a, it's a beautiful picture, but you know if you put them to scale, you wouldn't see them like this. Um, and then you see the SLS um, lower lower down, both in a crew and a cargo variant. And that's what you know we, SLS is designed so that um, we can safely put crew into deep space, but also lift very large um, cargo missions. And so, we, and all of those are going to be needed if we're really going to live and work in space, which is what I think all of us on this panel hope to be doing. So if you look about, um, specifically about the power or the engines that will be powering SLS, Aerojet Rocketdyne provides both the lower stage and the upper stage engines. And I'll go through on the next slide how they fit in the various SLSs. You know, the RS-25 is the core, and as I think John said, we're, you know, four RS-25s will power the core. Uh, I've been to quite a number of single engine test firings and do a shuttle launch, but I can hardly wait for that, that core stage test. That will be, uh, you know, we should, we should sell tickets for that. You know, I think that, 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 could, that could really help with the program funding. Uh, probably can't do that, but, you know, you want all these new ideas, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that will be amazing. Um, a single engine test, if you ever get a chance. If you haven't been to one, try to get a chance to go to one. They are, they are simply amazing, and a video doesn't do it justice. Um, the the RS-25 and its SSME configuration flew successfully 135 times, took um, all the astronauts into space from U.S. soil. And now we're looking at a, diff you know, a, um, a different variant of this with a new control system operating at different power levels to power um, the SLS program. It's still, it's an amazing engine. It's been upgraded a number of times during its, during its life. Um, and we're going through another upgrade right now. And I'll talk a little bit about one we hope to be doing also in the future. RL-10 similarly is another LOX hydrogen engine. Again, very reliable, flown many, many missions. Um, for this country, actually powered Voyager a number of decades ago, but has been also upgraded many times throughout its um, lifespan. And I'll talk about the different um, configurations we'll be flying here, both on the ICPS as well as the EUS variant. So here's a, just a picture of the, the potential um, SLS variant, starting with the 70-ton configuration we'll be flying for EM-1 and then going all the way through um, the 130-ton uh, deep space cargo um, heavy lift configuration. 
On the first one, which will be flying EM-1 and 2, we'll be having four, S, four RS-25s and one RL-10 on the ICPS, as John was talking about. And then we'll phase in the EUS in the heavier upper stage for the 105-ton configuration. Um, and again, similarly, four RS-25s on the base. And then uh, the advanced booster, uh, you know, further down in the next decade, would come online to provide the full 130 ton, 30 tons of um, of uh, payload capability. In terms of readiness, both, um, and, and I, it's interesting whenever I see Bill Gerstmeyer, I think every single time he talks about SLS, he talks, I'm not going to wait on the engines this time. And it's um, typically, you know, engines can be a, a long pull in the tent or a critical path. For um, this program, all engines are ready for EM1. They're all ready to be integrated. Actually, the RL10 is integrated um, for the ICPS. The four um, RS-25s are ready to go, um, and they're, they hopefully will be integrated early in the year and test fired next, you know, next summer. This is a picture of the firing. Um, I wanted to put a video in, but we didn't have time. Um, and the thing about the, the RS-25 for SLS, uh, we fired it at 113% this year. It's actually going to be operating at 111, which is higher than we did um, for space shuttle main engines. So we're we're, um, you know, it, the engine has lots of capability and we're, we're going to use that capability. Um, the one thing I will say about the, you know, we're testing at Stennis, um, have a great stand there, but that stand is also getting worked out like crazy. I mean, we're, we've got that thing booked for the next uh, four or five years as we not just get all the engines ready that, that we have already built, but also start producing um, the new engines that will, will go on the EM4 and later missions. And to talk about that, and we talk sustainability, we have engines for the first several missions ready, and what we're doing is putting the new controllers and certifying those. We're also um, bringing online um, a new production facility that will, will build the RS-25 differently than we did in the past. And we're um, infusing, you know, in the, the number of years since RS-25 was originally designed, this country's made tremendous advancements in um, manufacturing methods, materials, how you do rocket engines. And the, the RS-25 that, that is being built now is um, going to be an amazing engine. Um, again, maintain the reliability, the performance, but at um, you know lower cost and far more sustainable. Um, we had many one-of-a-kind type operations previously. Now what we're doing is going to be using um, techniques that we use amongst all of our different rocket engines. So overall, it'll be far more sustainable. We've, we've gone through a pretty methodical process looking at the engine because what we don't want to do is lose the um, qualification history, the tremendous amount of testing. It's probably the most characterized engine on the planet. We don't want to lose that. What we want to do is build off of that and um, take this to the next generation, which is what we're doing. So we are on contract now to build six of these and, um, again, with a with a, um, a target for significant cost reduction and then continuing to look at um, additional ways to upgrade the engine. We use a lot of additive manufacturing um, in the future engine. We have some additive manufactured parts that we're testing now. We also have some new chamber technologies that we're using and we've just been firing those this summer. So as we're going through qualifying um, the engines for flight, we're also testing all these new components in a pretty methodical way so we don't violate the qual, qual history of the engine. So look at the RL-10, these are the two configurations we're looking at, the B-2 on the ICPS and the RL-10C-3 on the EUS. And they're, they're again, variants of the same um, core engine, but um, different interfaces, different nozzle configurations. The, um, the B-2 engines, the ICPS engines are delivered. Right now we've done the, the functional configuration um, audit for the uh, EUS engines and we'll be delivering flight engines um, next year. This engine also is being evolved, again, changing the manufacturing and trying to uh, make it um, sustainable for the future. It's going to be flying on several, it flies today on the Atlas and the Delta and will be flying on several of the um, new systems that are coming online with the Air Force and, you know, our goal is to, to make sure all these programs benefit from all the improvements and so they can, you know, all reap the uh, benefits of the affordability. So we're ready to go and we can't wait to go and so looking forward to it, Bill. All right. Thank you, Julie.
Okay, we have about uh, 10 minutes left in our panel. Uh, I'd like to invite anybody to ask us any questions you wish. And this is how the questions are going to work. We've got Chris Crumley and Jim Way going to be running up and down the stairs, so please make sure that you have a question at the top, then at the bottom at the top, get them their exercise. Yeah. And you have a single sentence question. We're not going to do multiple sentences. When you stop to take a breath, they're going to take the microphone away <laughs> so that we don't get speeches from you. So single sentence question, and we'll go for about, uh, about ten. another 10 minutes yeah. for questions. Uh, Mr. Mr. Oh, sorry. Uh, good morning. Uh, Frank Slazer, Aerospace Industries Association. Question for Andy Allen, which is that uh, given forecasts for substantial sea level rise near the Cape and we're building for the future, as Julie noted, when are, are we taking protections towards the pads to make sure that uh, they aren't going to be impacted as, uh, as the seas rise? That's a good question. And we are from the sense of uh, trying to make sure that the pads can endure the environment that's down there at Kennedy Space Center. So a lot of thought and design was taken into it, even to the point of taking Category 5 hurricanes, I guess. And hopefully we will not have to go through one, but if we do, there's something there. But, you know, KSC is going to be a pretty exciting place here. It is, and it will be even more so because this multi-spaceport facility center that it's going to be down there there's there's opportunity for having half a dozen launch pads all up and running at the same time and launching rockets you know a few different rockets on a on a monthly basis down there so it's going to be a pretty exciting place and you can have four or five or more users rocket builders out there launching some rockets to support all the multiple opportunities that we have to go into space thanks it was very interesting a couple about a month ago when we had the mobile launcher out at 39B, we actually had three pads, uh, 39B, 39A, and, and 41 that had crew access arms. It's the most that we've ever had on the coast there uh, in preparation for both SLS and Orion and the uh, commercial crew launches. Um, Mr. Precourt, you mentioned a uh, change in mindset between development and production and change in attitude. Could you elaborate on that change? Sure. There's a so the question was about de development versus production. There's a lot of different pieces to that answer. One of them is uh, the way we think about development is a time period when you need to force experimentation and you need to iterate on um, your concept. And that means you have to be flexible to change. And when you get into production, you, you have a, a lockdown recipe. You need it to be exactly the same every time for quality control. So there's a left brain, right brain kind of thinking from a producer's standpoint that needs to be extremely well managed. When you're doing both development and production in the same facility with the same workforce, you can get escapes on production or you can miss opportunities on development. And both of those are extremely important to manage. Um, from a cost standpoint, um, there is a, a common curve that looks like a bell uh, for development where you start out slowly, then you ramp up in development, you do a lot of testing, and then you taper off. Uh, we didn't have the benefit of that this time. We had to stretch out a very flat development cost uh, uh, kind of profile. Um, but because of the nature of all of the different test articles, the design iterations, the flexibility, as I mentioned, to want to do different experimentation to get to an optimum design, that phase is very expensive, and you, you certainly can't be measuring unit cost under that kind of environment. Once you move to production and you lock down a design, you're very predictable and repeatable in what you do. Like John mentioned, the time that comes out of a production run is dramatic. On uh, the boosters that we're doing for Omega, the wind time to make a case went uh, down by two-thirds already. We built six of them. So, uh, those things are very important to get us onto a cost profile that is sustainable for the long run. Um, and then the other thing about it is our interface as contractors with the government, with the NASA, on how we buy these things in the future so that we have the optimum pricing, uh, that you don't have starts and stops on the production line, which are very expensive because you have your workforce idle. You have to optimize what they can produce in a given period of time. So all of that is in front of us, and we've got to do a super job of making it optimized on the production side. All right, okay, I have a question you. right over here. Uh, Bill, right here first. Oh, okay. 
Good morning. My name is Justin McNeil from the Aerospace Corporation. And I just uh, had a much bigger picture question given the uh, tagline, galvanizing U.S. leadership in space. Wondering how you all, as both industry leaders and, of course, as our representative from NASA, think about how we build our human resources moving into the next several decades such that we have the right set of um, engineers, scientists, and all to undergird and be the foundation for our future work. So I was wondering how you all have thought about that. Well, I'll start out um, you know, keeping, uh, keeping the, uh, the continuity of people is, is, is pretty much an imperative for us. The, the knowledge base uh, is a challenge to make sure we keep. At the same time, we've got to make sure that we, we keep the blood flowing as well. So we've got to work the demographics of all of that. We've got to make sure that things flow. It, it's not a simple process to bring somebody on board and have them certified in a very short period of time to do all the kinds of things that we do. Um, honestly, I would say you know, people make a lot of life decisions based on location, passion, and money. We got a great location in Florida. We love it. Um, the money, we're a NASA government program, so it's so-so. You know, from an industry perspective and an industry comparison, uh, to be honest. Um, so it's the passion. And I'll tell you what, most everything and what everybody does and why they stay where they stay the passion is insurmountable. The passion is, is more than you can find in any other place, at least I've been in my travels. And it's certainly what makes people want to come to work in the morning, care about what they do, and make it all work. Uh, having this leadership in space is something that's going to take a lot of passion and commitment to do. And, and that's really what I focus on from, from bringing people on board down at the Kennedy Space Center. And I would say we still see that passion in folks just coming out of college today. Uh, folks really are interested in this work. I think the statistics are within a couple of years. Lockheed Martin's going to be over 50% uh, of folks that have graduated in the last five years. Uh, so it's really important to us to get uh, kids right out of, I know I'm not supposed to say kids, HR's going to yell at me. Fresh out. Yeah. <laughs> Early career. All right. uh, so, uh, but it's really important for us to bring folks right from school to get them into the workforce, to get them trained up. Um, we had a situation that's probably similar to some of the things that, that Andy's dealing with, our technician workforce in Florida. Um, we started with a lot of the team from the space shuttle that had been there for years. They weren't ready to retire, but now all of a sudden, yeah, this has been great. They've built a couple of Orions now, and some of them are ready to retire. So we actually have started an apprenticeship with one of the local community colleges, which is bringing technician folks in, train them while they're getting their associate's degree, um, being paid, and then we've had great success at moving them into the workforce. Yeah, I'd pile on to that if I could uh, for a moment. Um, like Mike, uh, we are uh, today, as we sit here, one in four of my workforce, one in four people less than two years on the job. By this time next year, one in two will be less than four years on the job. That's an immense challenge, and they're all very, very capable people. The education system is pushing out kids, HR violation, youngsters, young career folks, um, at tremendous levels of knowledge and capability and passion, frankly, as Andy says, they really want to be a part of this, and we're providing a program that speaks to their future. Um, but what we really need to give them are the background lessons that we all lived um, from both a safety and a business standpoint. You need to understand really what was behind all of the lessons, why things are being done the way they are today, what's in the art of possible for things to be changed, what's not, what shouldn't be, what can be. Um, if we don't provide them that, uh, they can't build upon those lessons in a more productive way. So I think that's what we all need to focus on. I'll just put in a pitch for the Coalition of Deep Space Exploration. Marilyn Dittmar has a program now uh, that speaks to that in Washington, especially for the members of staffs on the Hill who are really important to our, our future. Uh, they have a, a Space 101 uh, program that they've given to a lot of staffers and it's become very popular. And it does the same thing. It looks at what, why do we do architectures the way we do? Why do we build things the way we do? What did we learn from the past? What do we not want to repeat from our history? And, uh, and so we all need to be thinking about that within our own companies and more broadly as a community. 
Okay, we're going to have two more quick questions and quick John answers. Wants to no, say something I'm good. On that. I'm this good. is a really I'll, important I'll topic, so go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that the, the demographics of who is building the nation's uh, heavy lift capability is not represented at this, these two tables. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, if you went down to Michoud, you would be amazed at how young yeah. the, uh, the team is down there and how excited they are about this very mission. But it's not only good for, for them and for the nation to bring up uh, – younger folks uh, in this kind of business. It's also good for us too, because I, you know, I, I spent all my time down at Michoud and I had a young man approach me uh, last week and he said, uh, Mr. Shannon, we're, we're having a hard time, you know, lining up these sensors that, that we have to get just right. And we're taking too many non-conformances on them. And what I think we should do is go, go 3d print this little plastic thing that'll allow us to get it up and, and I mean that's right and uh, and he walked me over there right and he showed me what he was doing and he went in for for 19 cents he said he could print these things that reduced our cycle time on putting these 900 sensors on the vehicle about in half and um, and so would that occur to me no it would not but we're bringing not only the new people in but also new ideas in and new capabilities in and they can they they're making it better they are doing they're showing us new ways to do things that they have learned uh, either in school or in trade school, and uh, I think it's overall it's uh, it's making the program a much much more uh, much more capable, uh, sustainable kind of program. The only thing I'd like to add, I echo most of the things you guys are saying, but we also need to make sure we we capture people's imaginations at an even younger age. So locally and and supporting our science centers and STEM activities, particularly in the late grade school, junior high is is critical to make sure that that pipeline stays fit, stays full because once they get in and they're playing and they're in space, I mean, most most people, especially with rocket engines, you know, maybe, I don't know about tanks, but I know rocket <laughs> engines. They were welding they, big, <laughs> big pieces of metal. No, and you get to launch them. So they, 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 the passion's there and they stay, but, but you can't ignore the uh, pipeline before that too. So um, continued efforts there with outreach are critical. Thanks. Okay, Jim. <laughs> Just one more question. Okay. This is Dan Casey with KBR Wiley, and I was just interested in hearing, Mike, you touched on um, reduction in weight and, and uh, new technologies was touched on by everybody there, right? You know, so what were some of the new technologies that you were able to uh, use to um, reduce the weight of the, the modules? Well, one, one of the, the, the big things just from the, the module itself was being able to reduce the number of welds, the number of pieces so that we're getting more efficient machining. Uh, across uh, all of those panels, we're, we're getting rid of heavy uh, weld landlines where, you know, the attachments are. Uh, but the other thing, you know, when we talk the theme of, of uh, technology, and I, I found my old college slide roll in a bag uh, last weekend, so it, you know, <laughs> kind of keeps hitting me. The, uh, everything we do today is digital. You know, it's digital design right to digital machining. Uh, all the tools we were talking about that, that uh, our early professionals bring into the workforce are just totally different than, than the way we engineered systems in the past. We talked about 3D printing. Uh, John had a great example, and it, you know, we talk about 3D printed parts that fly in the vehicle, so we'll move from four parts on EFT-1 to 112 on EM-1. But on the ground side, oh, we're geez. using 3D printed uh, drill guides all over the place and it's a huge savings but you don't think about it in the same way because it's not you know sexy like flying it on the vehicle but it's huge how much those kind of technologies have have come in and allowed us to change things and allowed us to save weight and cost in the whole process okay. bill panel thank you very much okay thank you yeah.